supposed to be a low of three again. No, that was last night. Sorry. Nice. So right now it's 36. Tomorrow we're supposed to get a big ass snowstorm. And then it's supposed to be <coughs> almost 50. It's it's all over the place. Two, di- two days ago, it was, oh man. I was in the morning when I went for a hike, it was negative 15. Wow. Well, yeah, so you, te- you texted me that day. <laughs> and I told you you were nuts. <clears throat> it was so cold, bro. It was nuts. It was not. How's everything been with you, though? Uh, pretty good. We're getting like the same. So we're getting like the same kind of fluctuation in weather this week, just not to the extremes. Like, so our low is a negative three. It's like eighteen, and then, <laughs> and then our high is a little bit like we're going up to like fifty again sometime this week. So yeah, it gets the lows here. That's the coldest temperature I've ever felt. It was uh, negative fifteen, and then went, went with windshield on the weather app. So it was negative thirty. Okay, that's so that's it, cold. Freezing, <laughs> yeah. freezing. So um, it was totally nuts. Other than that, yes, though, everything's good. Everything is good. Yeah, business is going good. Nice. Um, I had a new patient yesterday. Who? Uh, funny scenario. I'm sure this has happened to you quite often. He. <laughs> He was he threw his back out in CrossFit deadlifting, like really bad. Mm-hmm. And I was talking about form, and he goes, no, I have perfect deadlift form. And the chances are most people do not have good deadlift form. Yeah. And he was probably pulling with his lumbar spine. It wasn't hip hinging properly and warming. You know, because what they do is I'm like, well, explain to me the workout. What do you guys mm-hmm. do? And they're like, well, we just work up to a three rep max. I'm like, that's so arbitrary. Like, that's not, <laughs> that's just like not an can intelligent. You, can you tell me why? <laughs> yeah, like, you know, oh, we work up to a three rep max, and I have friends that compete, in, or not compete, no, they do local competitions, mm-hmm. but um, I watch their videos on their channel. Man, it's like the exorcist, like lumbar flexion fully. Yeah. And everyone's in the background. Everyone's like, yeah, I'd be in the background. You'd see me. You'd see my face in the background. No. Like, <laughs> like what are we're you cutting doing? the weight in half we're starting over <laughs> i know i know it's funny my buddy and i were just talking today about the actual benefit of using a free floating smith machine to learn how to kind of tuck your hip under okay. during a yeah. hinge mm-hmm. like with just the bar like feeling feeling the hinge yeah. you know that no, i've really only way. seen like two of those ever like i never see them around we got a sick one in our gym Dude. that I love using. Yep, that one I like. But the, some of the other ones I don't like because they're kind of on an angle mm-hmm. like that. And I don't – like depending on what movement I'm doing. Yeah, I mean um, you're not necessarily using that angle. <laughs> no, exactly. It doesn't really fit well for – I try and stay away from – let's see. What machines don't I use because it doesn't feel good for me? The shoulder press – Hammer. I was going to say that I don't like any sort of overhead press machine. No, it, it locks no. me in, especially since I uh, dislocated my shoulder when I was 21. Mm-hmm. Um, I need, I, I have to like pretty much ex- exclusively use dumbbells. I can get away with like a barbell because it, again, it allows me to kind of move yeah, a little move bit back away. and forth. Um, but I need that freedom of motion because I, I know my left shoulder does not track the same as my right. So no, <laughs> either it doesn't track the same way and then you're locked in to mm-hmm. those mechanics. Another one I don't like, I'm trying to think. Um, uh, maybe certain like tricep push down machines. I, I'm not a, I, I'm not a huge fan of, fan of, but I do love hack squats. I can. I like. Me too, dude. Squat. I would take a hat swat over a leg press any day. Me too. Me I too. Love it. They actually have you. Um, you know RP, right? We talked about that. Renaissance periodization. Doctor Mike Intel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So their new book, which you would love, I just finished it. It okay. just came out a month ago. Uh, Principles of Hypertrophy. Mm-hmm. They talk about what they've been seeing in new studies versus axial loading. So like a squat or a hat squat mm-hmm. versus a a more horizontal, like a leg press. Okay. And like the different fibers and how you activate different areas a little bit more, sure. maybe some more rectus, of, uh, rectus femoris. It was just really cool. But I know for me, hack squats probably feel the best. Yeah. You know, unless it's the Cybex. You know the Cybex leg press, the one that kind of like curls 
It doesn't go straight down like this. Oh, um, I've That's never. I've never like seen one in real life. I've only seen it on the phone. <laughs> oh, it, it, it's a, it's a, it's like a pendulum swing. Yeah, it has yeah, yeah. a arc to it, mm -hmm. so it fits the mechanics. Like we have a leg press in my gym from 1991 in the corner. Right. That's like, oh man, was this thing not made for mechanics? It's like, oh boy, it's like from Arnold's home gym. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so great but yeah what do you want to talk about today i'm down to talk about anything dude i uh i really had no plan i just knew it's been a while and i needed me some dr nick Panella in my life so and i know you've always okay. got something to talk about and how so about this? How, about you pick, <laughs> how about you pick a topic and then i'll pick a topic and we'll go from there so you pick you pick the first one i'm putting you on the spot all right that's fair um i would like to talk about then um adherence not just necessarily like diet adherence or uh, any any sort of fitness wellness sort of adherence um because i was actually talking about this with a, a friend earlier uh he we just did a podcast actually earlier this morning about how um you know like exercise culture and where everyone feels and i guess this could play right into the uh uh crossfit kind of theme but um everyone feels that they need to like beat themselves up every training like every day. Um, and then it kind of segued into well, like, that's, that's why we can't adhere to anything is because, you know, you can't sustain that kind of training day in, day out. Like you can't sustain like these extreme diets where you lose, you know, 20 pounds in like a month. Uh, like that's why, that's why there's all that yo-yoing. And I think we even talked about it before. Is yeah, like, we, we don't, as a country, we don't have a weight loss problem. We have a weight regain problem. Anyone can go on a diet and lose a bunch of weight. It's keeping it off. And the reason why we can is because of these extremes that we do. Like we cut, I'm cutting out, you know, dairy. Like, I don't know, someone told me to, so I'm going to do it. And I lose 20 pounds, but I, like you can't like sustain that. I mean, maybe some people can, but <laughs> but, you, but you understand what I'm saying. You make these extreme kind of changes. Like you have this extreme, uh, you know, training regimen that like just cannot be sustained for the long haul. Um, and I think that has been something that's become very important uh, to me um, because I was once one of those people who, you know, all I wanted to do was lift heavy. Uh, my rep, like high reps were six. Um, um, and I went through that period of just like, I would get strong, I would get injured, I would have to take time off, I'd have to like rehab. And I just kind of going through that roller coaster over and over and over and over again. Um, and to me, it's become very important to really kind of stress, like, it's not a race. Like you have to pick something that works for you and it needs to work for you in like this version of you right this second. So like maybe, you know, I'm walking into the gym, uh, with my first training session and maybe I had never, uh, never gone on a diet before, never touched a weight before, like. I need to find what's going to work for me now. And then once I improve, now I can reassess and find what works for me, like future me, like for a month down the road and then two months down the road, that kind of thing. Um, and I think people get frustrated and don't necessarily put in the time and understand like, all right, this is going to be a process. Like I don't want to go on diets and lose weight and gain weight and lose weight and gain weight the rest of my life. Like I want to be able to eat, you know, whatever I want, but I want to be able to sustain a healthy, and that's why I try to stay away from diet, but a healthy diet, but healthy nutrition for the long haul. And uh, that's actually something, so me and my fiance have been going through, uh, we're getting married in about a month, and you know, we've both like, you know, trying to lose some like weight for the wedding or whatever, but like neither of us have made like drastic strides because we're kind of just continuing what we're, we've been doing for the last like pretty much two years. Um, and we've even like had conversations. We're just like, we really haven't like changed much. Um, and like, even after the wedding, we're just like, we're, we're just going to continue doing what we do and like kind of whatever, like whatever. And we like, just to put it in perspective, like, so I'm about 20 pounds down from July. No, um, nice. without making any real significant kind of changes. I really just kind of realized that like 
my diet was probably too reliant on like breads. So I kind of just limited that and just made sure that I ate like more. I mean, that was it. Like my, my diet basically consists of it's based around proteins, fats, fruits and vegetables and like nuts. Um, and, but look, like on the weekend, if we like go out, like I will go nuts on a pizza because to me, I've, I've created this healthy relationship or food where I'm doing what I want to do, which is, and I'm eating right. Like most of the time where I don't feel guilty if I go out and like eat two cheeseburgers, three slices of pizza and wash it down with a milkshake. I would just be like, all right, that was fun. Like now I'm just going to kind of go along with my life <laughs> and, exactly. and not feel like I have to, Oh, I got to be like, go bust my ass in the gym. And I think they kind of intertwine in that sense where people, you know, they diet a bunch, they feel guilty about something that they hate. Then they have to beat themselves up in the gym about it because they have to like punish themselves because they like treated themselves. And it starts this kind of negative cycle where everything is trying to undo what you've done as opposed to basically just kind of building yourself up to be the best, best you in the future. Does that kind of make sense? Yes. Yeah. And there's a couple <laughs> ways. Of, so I've I'm gonna, got my pen right. Pen, my paper, my pen next to me. There's a couple, there's a couple ways that, that I see it. So the first one, which Jeff Nipper did a tremendous video about a week and a half ago. He interviewed uh, Eric Trexler, Lane Norton, Eric Helms, um, uh, uh, Cliff Wilson, who, if you don't know who Cliff Wilson is, he's gotten 128 people pro cards. That's a lot of anecdotes. Yeah. And then totally fit, whatever her name is, she's a, uh, I think she's a master's in behavioral. So the one thing I think what, what people forget is when you're making a new habit, and I had this with a client very recently, as we know, in the beginning of a habit, way more self-control is needed because you need to consciously be self-aware. Okay, I need to, I'm in a calorie deficit. I know if I eat 15 cookies right now, like I'm used to doing, it's going to throw <laughs> me out of the deficit. So yeah. what happens is I think people subconsciously, because the society we've talked about, we want everything right now. They forget that that self that that phase of changing the behavior. You might need self control for a couple months, you know. Because people ask me all the time, "Well, how can you do that?" I'm like, "Well, I've been counting my macros for a decade." Yeah, and <laughs> yeah. I know, so it like, just it wakes up and this is what I, this is what I'm doing. It's like I don't even like, think about it. No, I know I know food content so well to my body that. I know what foods are going to put me probably over my maintenance. If I'm in a maintenance phase, what I can get away with if I'm more in a deficit, I'm very balanced like that, but they forget because they're like, Oh, that's so hard. I'm like, well, that would be like me right now. You looking at me and you being like, why can't you speak French? I'm like, because, <laughs> because I don't know how, like, I have to, I have to learn. but like you and me don't have this conversation and in our minds, we're not like, okay, what vowel do I have to use next? Like, you know, we understand yeah. English as a habit. That's one major part, I think, why people fail. The second part is, as you said perfectly, nutrition and training will stick with those two, mm -hmm. but it could be any habit change. But like, sure. you go to, it's everywhere. You're in the store, like we've talked about before, you see the magazine, the waist. I lost 70 pounds in two months. <laughs> yeah. it's well, that's amazing. That's what I want to do. And I can't be mad at them because they don't know that how you and me do. So that's why our purpose in life is to, and it's always, always, in my opinion, going to be an uphill battle. Now that's not a bad thing. It's just that there's more people that don't understand that mm -hmm. do understand. And if there was more people that understood, we wouldn't have an obesity problem because people could understand they could eat the foods they enjoy, pizza, cake, ice cream, balanced, and yeah. not be worried about it. And the psychological aspect of food is something that I was just had a, a, a business meeting with a friend. She lives in the UK. She is a burlesque dancer and she's not fairly overweight, but she wants to lose some weight. Mm -hmm. And this goes to show you habits. I said, well, tell me about your eating habits. And that's how I always structure it. Sure. She said, well, every day it's like Christmas at my house. We have dinner, we have pudding, we have wine, we have desserts, we have, that's just the way, we have tea. I always yeah. bust her balls for that. Tea. I'm like, oh, do you have tea too? <laughs> and she's so British. And 
She didn't realize that it's such a habit. Like it's such a family habit. And if you think that it's going to be hard to change not only yourself, you're going to have to stump, step into the uncomfortability of being like, like with my wife. My wife knows I get up seven days a week at five in the morning. Saturday, Sunday, I like consistency. Mm -hmm. uh, if I start to sleep on the weekends till six or seven, it affects the rest of my week and I don't enjoy it. And she knows that that's what I like. But the thing is, some of these people who have like two people with bad habits, like let's say you and me were, were an average couple, we're both 35% body fat. Right. And I'm like, I'm like, honey, maybe we shouldn't have cake in the house. And you're like, we always have cake in the house. Yeah, I like cake. I want it. <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and that's what happens. So, um, in my so I, I remember, I don't, I don't want to cut you off, but I, okay, yeah. you, you jog my memory. And I, it was off, might have been off like the CDC website or something. And I was doing research for uh, something and it had to do with like obesity. And it was, it, it wasn't the CDC. It had, it was like a website. It might have been like a, a college website or something. They were doing research directly with like obesity and then relationships. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and again, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but it was something like, uh, you know, like it was childhood obesity. Sorry, I'm like jogging my own memory as I talk. Um, <laughs> um, it was um, something along the lines of like, so child, like I think like something like twenty percent of children are obese, something like that. Uh, I'm ballparking. Don't quote I me. I think it, I think it is around that. I think you're correct. I think it's it might be a little lower, but it, it was alarmingly high, like and around twenty. Um, and I was watching the numbers, and it was as like the more like that there is like obese, like if there's obese parents, like it the percentage skyrockets. Skyrockets. Um, if there's obese friends skyrockets it's like all these people like the relationships around you you guys build habits together and you create this sense of like normalcy um and so like you're 100 percent right like if you if one person uh like one spouse or one person in a relationship is trying to make significant changes without the support of the other one it again i don't know the numbers but it's some significant percentage of the time it fails because you need and if that a child person. is obese the statistics yeah. are also very clear. If a child is obese, they have like a, I don't know, whatever percent chance of struggling with obesity for the rest of their lives. It's yeah. not just, you know, and, and I, I, it's funny you say that because I, I just said this maybe a couple days ago to another patient. I said, how many obese kids do you see that have in-shape parents? Yeah. Almost never. It's, yeah, no. I, no, you don't see I would, I would, I'm sure there's the exception, but I would almost say never, yes. <laughs> never. Almost would say never because they're on top of that because they have family habits. They probably, you know, don't maybe use as much hydrogenated oils. And not that that's bad for you. It's just that, you know, I see people, oil, 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 oil in yeah. the pan. I'm like, you do know that that's nine calories per gram and you just put 700 grams in that pan. <laughs> you know? So it's the little things like that. And then the other thing is, it's good that you brought up the dairy thing because that's very common too. This is the this is the connection. The that's like a new one for me. Yeah, they'll be like this. They'll be like, um, I cut out dairy. I lost twenty pounds. So dairy's the reason I'm fat. No, it's not. The calorie <laughs> surplus from dairy was yeah. the reason you're fat. You know, uh, I lost weight because of keto. No, you lost weight because you're in a calorie deficit. You're just cooking more of your own food, so you're controlling what's in it. You know, and I think when it comes down to adherence. Um, people, like I said, they forget that to be able to have good consistency and adherence, it takes time. You have to learn how to walk before you can ride a bike or run, whatever those sayings are. So that and was one of the first things I would teach every single one of my clients back when I was training was, um, was like, we're going to change, like, we're going to make one significant change and that's it. Like, I'm not here to overhaul your entire way of life. Like you've never, you've never done this before. So we're not going to train four days a week. I'm not going to have you change your entire diet, like your sleep schedule, all that stuff. I'm just like, you're going to come in. Let's let's come in three days a week, okay? And I want you at home to focus on just having a good, nutritious breakfast. That's all I want you to focus on. Once we get a month in, maybe that becomes more of your routine. You don't have to think about, all right, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this for breakfast, this, this, this. Once you're just up, you know what you're having, boom. You've been working out in the gym three days a week for a month. All right, now we switch it up. Now I want you to focus on breakfast and lunch. All right, you take care of those. And then maybe we can, you know, go from a half hour sessions to hour sessions. Like, 
And then you build off that, right? Because if you overhaul everything, that's where you burn it. Perfect. And the best thing is, when we talk, I know we talked about this uh, before because I've talked about this a lot. You know, people will look at me crazy and I say this, uh, you know, just use an extreme example because a lot of people do do this. Uh, what do you do? Okay, every single day I go to McDonald's on my way to work, five days a week, and I get a large number two. I say, okay, get a medium. Yeah. They're like, wait, you want me to get McDonald's? I said, no, no, <laughs> you're not going to listen to me. Most people don't <laughs> hear that. It's why this, this doesn't work and it will never work. You have to eat more fruits and vegetables. That's the standard doctor talk. Yeah. You got to eat more fruits and vegetables, eat more whole grains, like bring your saturated fat. It's like, doc, I, I've known that since I was three. Like, exactly. <laughs> I'm not going to change like today. Exactly. You yeah. know, and it's, it never works and it never will work. And that's why you and me, the way we're, the way how we're, you know, going about this is it go, it comes down to habits. We are creatures of habit. Like everything is a habit that we do. Some are, I mean, like we've talked about, you're not thinking about which way to get out of bed or thinking about which hand to drive with your steering wheel. Those are so ingrained <laughs> habits. And it's the same way with us like exercise. I'm not like, oh, I have to go to the gym today. I go to the gym because I love it, yeah. but because it's also a very instilled habit. Yeah. So I think adherence and consistency, as we both know, especially in nutrition, if you can't adhere to it, I tell people this too. Let's say you want to do keto, and I am not the, a big proponent of keto, and let's say you can stick with that. But I'm telling you, it's not optimal for endurance athletes. Mm -hmm. No research supports that. Yeah. And you're like, well, I enjoy it. Do it. If you yeah. enjoy it and you can adhere to it, it's good. But the problem is 99% of people go, well, now it's better for you. Well, that's not true. Mm -hmm. You just can adhere to it, you know? And, and once you once you equate calories, I mean, dude, I've read every RP Now Diet Book to Lane Norton's Fat Loss Forever, every article on nutrition on mass research, it all comes down to the same thing. When total calories are accounted for and equal across all diets, there is no change in biomarkers and health. I was but, actually just gonna bring up like Lane Norton before you before you brought him up. Um, because I think and again I, I don't know uh, the exact numbers that he says or whatever or percentages, but it's something like as long as you eat like, you know, calorically within your uh, or like below. Um, holy shit. <laughs> as long as you take in more than you more than you uh, burn, uh, less than you burn what? and your, your diet is maintained and maintained mostly of uh, protein. He goes the other if it's fat or carbs, he, he doesn't care. He goes, whatever. No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah, no. and yeah. that's and that's something that people don't understand is that they or don't understand, don't know. I don't want to say don't understand. Is that they just don't know? Is that um, you know, it it doesn't matter. Like now, obviously, yes. Like where the carbs come from. If you're eating a Snickers or whatever, like there's obviously better quality carbs you can be getting. Of course. Um, but yeah, that's that's the the guideline. It's the RP Diet Book Two. They said it perfectly. Okay, they had the pyramid. Split into levels. Obviously, the top level is what people focus on the most. Supplementation. 5% of body composition change. Yeah. Eric Trexler, who is a PhD, if you know who Eric Trexler is, he does lots of research. He said um, there is basically no supplement on the planet that's going to aid in your fat loss. And if it does, it's like 0.00001%. Yeah. But and underneath that, it's nutrient timing. Now, can those come into effect if you want to be the number one in what you do to Mr. Olympia? Yeah, then they come into play. But this is what they said in Metabolic yeah, Wars. Stuff. Guess how other many things that they're doing to make that 5% exactly. matter. Yeah. yeah, and in the nutrition <clears throat> aspect, the bottom of the pyramid is total calories. Above that is macronutrients. So your distribution between your carbs, proteins, and fat. In Metabolic Ward studies where they account for everything – I literally just read this like a week, not even a week ago. If you just do the bottom two, okay, and you eat like garbage, mm -hmm. if you're still matching your protein, but you're eating Snickers ice cream, we're not talking about health, we're talking about weight loss. Sure. You'll eighty percent of the of the uh, body composition changes. But what do most people do? They say this to you. Well, I eat healthy and I eat every two hours. Do you track your calories? No. If you take supplements and you just eat healthy, what people are taught to do, you'll get maybe 
of the body composition changes you're looking for. Because they'll be like, I had a buddy. I do not eat healthy. Run me through what you eat. Oh, he's a hiker, big hiker. Mm-hmm. I'm at his house. Run me through what you eat. Runs me through. I'm like, dude, you eat 900 calories a day. Um, that's He's like, I'm a hard gainer. I'm like, no, 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 you're, you're a not eater. <laughs> you're not a hard there's gainer. There's not enough here. Yeah. No, there's just not enough there. I have a buddy who's a hard gainer. He's an arborist from my gym. He, dude, I mean, he lifts logs all day. He yeah. told me that he trapped. He had to eat over 6,000 calories a day just to maintain his weight. I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. And he knows what he's doing because he competed in CrossFit at a decently high level. Okay. So I know he understands sure. pathways. Like, And when he told me that, I knew he wasn't joking. Mm-hmm. But again, that's not the norm. Like my buddy who's the RD in Montana, fun, crazy story. We were on the phone last night and I said, what's the craziest thing you've seen in practice so far? He was working with a social worker. Are you ready for this? I am. Guy came in. Okay, so as we both know, BMI isn't the best for exercising people, but very good for gen pop Mm -hmm. um, who don't who are sedentary. He had a BMI of 75. Is that even possible? 600 pounds. Big boy. Yep. So he and he says the hardest thing for him is, is it all comes down to the same thing. Like, you know, they'll say this to him. I'm doing what you're telling me to do. I'm tracking your calories. I'm not losing weight. Macros don't work for me. But the reality is, as we know, is we don't know what these people are doing at their house. Yeah. Chances are, Just what they tell well, there is no chance. There is no such thing as a chance. Yeah. If you have an okay metabolism and your maintenance calories are not like 900 a day and your metabolism is wrecked, like most people, yeah. that's another thing too that we know. I look at someone, they're like 300 pounds. Uh, okay, we'd say we do a two week test, weigh yourself every day, macros, everything, my fitness pal, and you didn't lose any weight. I'm like, well, you have to reverse diet, my friend, because we talked about this too. You don't have anywhere to go. Yeah. So yeah, the adherence and the consistency is probably the the most important thing ag- across the board. I think everyone agrees with that. Yeah. When it comes down to exercise, nutrition, work. You know, if you don't enjoy your work, you're not going to want to go to work. So <laughs> it's very simple. No, it's true. And that's that's the importance of finding something that works for you. And look, I'll even use uh, my mom has never been a gym person. She doesn't like lifting weights. She doesn't like, you know, running on the track. The same way. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't like running on the track. But she has found that she likes to do different outdoor activities. She likes to go for walks. She kayaks. Um her and my father used to be big skiers, uh, so they used to do a couple trips. Like she likes to be like active in outdoor kind of things. Of course, and it worked for her. Like that that was her exercise, and uh, again, and that's something that she can stick with, and she could do. You know, go on bike rides. Like she could do that kind of stuff every day, and she would enjoy it, and she would look forward to like coming home from work. She'd go right to the garage, grab her bike, and be out for an hour. Um, so yeah, well, so I don't want people to get the misconception that like we are saying that like, you have to enjoy lifting weights and you have to go know, here. Another, now there's, yeah. there's clearly benefits from lifting weights, um, but look, if you absolutely hate it, you're not going to stick with it. Just like yeah, a diet, yeah. if you absolutely hate cutting out every single carb, you're not going to stick with it, and it's no. not going to benefit you. No. Yeah. So I think that was. Uh, that was a big thing. And look, I, I went through, um, I was actually that person that you described the, uh, you know, I eat healthy and work out, but like, I'm kind of just maintaining a okay ish figure kind of thing. And then I, again, I had to take a good hard look. I was like, yeah, all right, I'm eating healthy, but I'm also eating a shit ton of food. Exactly. Uh, so. no, no, that's, that's a very important fact because that's a, that's a huge thing that's always talked about. People think because they eat healthy that they can't eat in a surplus. Yeah. That is 100% not true. Yeah. I can eat the, the cleanest, healthiest whole foods picked from a garden in Colombia, and I can <laughs> still gain weight. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, it's just, no. it's, that's the truth. It's just, that it's, uh, it's, it's tough for people to hear because, you know, look at the big names, the big names in nutrition. It's nothing against them as a human just about what they produce. Uh, Dr. Oz, who doesn't know anything about nutrition. 
um, Dr. Axe, who is the chiropractor. Do you know who Dr. Axe is? I'm actually not familiar with him, no. So Dr. Axe is the Dr. Oz of chiropractic. He is, his, you know, he's the type of guy that's like, you know, if you eat my bone broth supplements, you'll never get sick. Like, you know, oh, like man. crazy types <laughs> of yeah. queens. But like, they get on TV. Like, I've seen both of them on like Channel 5 or like, of Good Morning America, mm -hmm. and what happens at Good Morning America or like Oprah's show? You know, I try and tell people, listen, Oprah, man, if you sat me down in front of Oprah and I and I, she could speak to me for five minutes about business, I would be like, dude, I'd be like, oh my god, I'm gonna listen to everything. <laughs> yeah. but if you, if Oprah was gonna look at me and say, I want to talk to you about nutrition, I would say no thanks, because she's up and down and up and down and up and down, and what happens is. What Oprah forgets is that she is a beacon for female success. The amount of females that follow Oprah yeah. just because she's Oprah and what she does is outstanding. There's nothing wrong with that. But Oprah, whoever does her stuff is crazy. Or like Zac Efron in an interview <laughs> for, what did he say? He was like, oh, I didn't eat any carbs for 20 weeks. Oh, for Baywatch. Like, he said, he said like, he'd never do it again. He said he hated it. Yeah, because it, yeah. obviously he couldn't stick with it. It was drastic. And another thing is people think that there's only one celebrity trainer that I think actually knows their shit. And he got famous because of him. Do you know who Jordan Syatt is? S-Y-A-T-T? -T? No, I don't. He was Gary Vaynerchuk's training. He, like, trained okay. Gary. Okay. He actually is a very, like, evidence-based approach mm -hmm. person. And I think that's why Gary Vee lost a lot of weight and he actually maintains it because mm -hmm. he probably taught Gary how to do it sure. in a proper way. And Gary Vaynerchuk also is such a business minded person. If he thinks because he's going to see a good ROI, he'll do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But it's tough, man. It's definitely it's definitely an upward battle because uh, like I that girl I told you about in the UK, she just asked. It was so funny. She just asked me on Sunday, my refeed day. Uh, even in, the, in my deficit now, I still have a 550 <coughs> refi day. She said, well, do you eat chocolate or that? I said, if I'm hungry and I want to have something, I don't care what it is. Chocolate mousse cake, I don't care. I'm going to eat it and put it yeah. into my macros. Sometimes <laughs> my daily macros, I'm not saying this is healthy. Sometimes, sometimes my daily macros will be 50% calorie dense foods. I might eat a frozen pizza with with honey and like that's half my calories. But <laughs> what? What's the interesting part? Got my blood work done. Mm -hmm. Now I'm balanced. So we've talked about this. Low H, I mean good HDL, low LDL, low total cholesterol, low triglycerides. Everything was was normal or in the very good range. But like if people were to look at the way I eat sometimes They'll be like, oh, well, that's so unhealthy for you. I'm like, yeah, because you're looking at it in a single context form. Yeah, this is not like day you're, you're day a day out. You have a bad mm -hmm. relationship with food. Like, I've never looked at a Snickers. I literally just had a Snickers on Sunday. <laughs> I, 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 was in the, I was in Walmart. I'm like, I, I, but I always look at the macros because I know how much macros I have. Mm -hmm. And like, come on, dude. Right now, my low days are 225 protein, 400 carbs, 100 fat. That Snickers was 12 grams of fat, 30 carbs, and a, and a whopping four grams of protein. But like, <laughs> that's nothing. And the yeah. total calories, the rest of my food came from whole food the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. But people look at that food and they're like, that food makes you fat. No, that's not how it works. Yeah, you know? So you your diet. No, that, that's a good thing. I think another good way to segue into this mm -hmm. with, um, ooh, what's a good topic to talk about next? Okay, how are you? Let's think. Hold on. Do you want to talk about exercise or nutrition? Uh, I'm, I'm kind of on a nutrition kick. You want to keep going with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, um, <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's real quick. Let's go into the restriction stuff because I think that's okay. important to talk about if anyone's going to watch this and listen to that. So what do we know? Like we were, we've been talking about this whole time, but very clearly. The more restrictive your food pattern, the more chances you have of failing. Mm -hmm. So what does society do? We blame a macronutrient for like five years, then we switch it up. Carbs are the enemy. 
bats are the enemy. <laughs> you know, like they, it, that's a bad psychological, you know, outlook on food. Yeah. So what do you think, in your opinion, what do you think of, the, of all the people you've trained in your life, what do you think held them back the most? With nutrition. With nutrition? I mean... Yeah, what do you think helped them back the most? I don't want to say willpower because it's not that's not the exact term, but I think I, I think maybe it was just poor poor habits leading up to that point. So like so not that they didn't have the willpower to make the necessary changes. It's just that they were fighting such an uphill battle that it was so difficult that they really couldn't in that sense. And I think because a lot of the people, and again, my clientele ranged from, you know, like 13 year old kids to I trained someone who was in his 90s. Um, wow. So a lot of people kind of fell into that 30, 40, 50 kind of range. So that, those are some pretty established habits, you know, 30, 40, 50 years of these things. Um, so I would, most of the time I would just handle the training portion and I would try to talk nutrition as much as possible. But again, I'm not going home with these people. Um, and I wasn't going to be the trainer where I'm just like, all right, I want you to make a log of everything. Like, because I know people hate that and I, yeah, I, I don't do that. I don't do that from myself. So I'm not going to make them do it. Um, and I was just like, look, like if you have any questions, ask if like, please, like I can lay out like I, I can tell you what to eat or I can suggest but then like you you're at home by yourself like you kind of have to go do that on your own and I would I would get people who you know they would show progress in the gym they would get stronger they would be very uh they, you know they would adhere to the training program they would be consistent in the gym but you really wouldn't see much change composition wise and I was just like, look, we're, we're doing what we're doing here. And I can see that we're working and I, I have the numbers to prove it. So I need to know what's going on when I'm not with you. <laughs> and I, I think that to me is probably the most difficult thing. So I, I don't want to say like willpower because I know that they, you know, they, well, I mean, maybe it, it, it's a combination of willpower and, you know, breaking those habits. It's, it's definitely, it's not easy. And that's why, like I said, there's so many the, the, the family habits are huge. The lifestyle habits that you have on your own as an independent person. And then the cultural habits. Like, mm -hmm. Orca told me, I, I've been to France, but I was 13. I don't really remember it. That's actually you something know? that you, uh, I, I have clients who, a couple of my clients were like, you know, they had their own businesses and stuff. They had to entertain like clients and stuff. And a lot of the time they were out on the road, like eating dinner, whining and dining, like, that's I'm, tough. Yeah, that's yeah. That you just sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but that like no, what you did. said the the lifestyle and culture like that just popped right in my head. Like let's let's think about people that must be really hard to eat and sustain a healthy eating pattern. Uh, flight attendants. You're never you're on the go. Uh, you know surgeons who work twenty hour shifts. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's certain people where certain techniques might work better. So say. Say someone who is an, an ER emergency physician and they work 18 on, 48 off. You know, they might do better with intermittent fasting mm -hmm. because you can't be in the middle of an open heart surgery and be like, time out. <laughs> I got to get a shake in real quick. <laughs> Need a snack. <laughs> you know, so I, I took, maybe they do, who knows? Because the person's asleep. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so, you know, like in France, my wife was telling me people are just – like you and me would be considered like thicker guys there, she said, because everyone they're eating like the way they eat as a, as a family. And my buddy who works for Lane Norton, his name is uh, Mathis uh, David, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, he just made a great post yesterday about why people might be putting on weight. And he talked about something that no one ever talks about. In these other countries, dinner lasts like what three hours, mm -hmm. so they they take their time, which means they satiate uh, in a better pattern. Mm -hmm. When us, come on, if you sit down at McDonald's, by the time you shovel all that food in your mouth, those satiety hormones, at least from my knowledge, what I've read, and which isn't a lot on that particular subject, is that they're not even really being driven into effect mm -hmm. fully yet. Yeah. You know, the satiety system of your brain. Like I said, they had that woman, she was a PhD 
um, behavioral, eating behavioral on mass. And she talked about, uh, you know, the satiety system, the, um, uh, the hunger system and how they all intertwine. But when you eat really fast, you don't even give yourself a chance for yeah. those satiety. No, nothing, hormones. nothing's working yet. No, you're just shoveling food down, you know? And that's a huge problem that I know I have. I mean, I'm sure, I, I, dude, you know, being from Jersey, people just move faster, most people. Yeah. Well, I just, I just eat fast, you know? That's just how it is. But, um, but that's definitely a big one, too. Food choice, it's actually funny. Alan Aragon made a great post where he was like, he's all about flexible dieting and if it's your macros. But there are a lot of people that are like, all that matters is total calories. Well, that's not true either because that's also black and white. Mm -hmm. Food content does matter, you know, because as we both know, highly processed, highly palpable foods, saturated, hydrogenated, trans fat foods, they don't have any satiating properties. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like a good lean protein source is satiating. And that is a me mechanism in our hunger system yeah. that's supposed to keep you from being like, oh, I just ate 900 calories from this kit, this twi Twix. <laughs> I'm not full. Yeah. Let's have another one, you know? So, I mean, I don't know how you are, but I could tell you, and the research shows that they did like 40 foods on mass review what foods have the most satiety properties over a long period of time? White potatoes were number one. So, like, really? I know, yes, what? Not even sweet. I thought it was sweet. It was white potatoes. So, if I have like four servings of white potatoes, which is six hundred grams on the scale, hundred and six grams of carbs, with like eight ounces of like ninety three seven ground beef and like one tablespoon of coconut oil, mm -hmm. dude. That keeps me full for like seven hours, you know. <laughs> potatoes, <clears throat> potatoes specifically are very satiating for me, okay. big time. Uh, like broccoli is another one, obviously. Yeah. Um, lean meats, but like Twix, Kit Kats, ice cream. Come on, bro. You put okay. a gallon. Of ice cream, I'll smash a gallon of ice cream before any satiety <laughs> hormone. <to it. laughs> no, um, I think it was God. When was it? I think it might have been like New Year's. We uh, were at my future in-laws, and they had like the a little bowl of like those little uh, like fun size Twixes. Yeah, yeah. And it was there. It was just in a bowl in front of me, and I was just like, "Yes, yes, yes." Like I had like twenty of them before the night was over. <laughs> and, let... it's, and it's crazy too when you look at like. I'm gonna send you that article because I think yeah. you'll really like it. Like talking about why. Like the neurophysiology of, of how those foods don't fill you up, even though they're so high calorie dense. Mm -hmm. But it is totally crazy. Like if you just look at that, like you're not looking at a bowl, <laughs> you're not looking at a bowl of like fresh salmon and being like, oh, I can't stop. I can't <laughs> yeah. stop. But like if you oh, I forget, I forget who it was. But uh Yeah, it was something so, someone was making like it was like a joke of like the overeating like the snacks and like I think it was Doritos specifically which is another one where like if you put that bag in front of me it's gone. gonna be gone. Gone. But like you've never heard someone say like oh God I shouldn't have eaten that entire bowl of broccoli like, <laughs> like <laughs> no so because you're cool. right because there's there's that mechanism that triggers the satiety where you just you're just like all right like I'm I'm done. <laughs> like, I'm, yeah. <laughs> it's definitely interesting. Now, I'm not sure if I'm bought into this. I don't know anything about this research, but okay. I am going to talk about it because I think it was cool. Have you watched – I might have asked you this. Have you watched Zac Efron's new show on Netflix? Um, I've seen, like, a couple of episodes, but I haven't, like, did watched you, it. Did you see the one where they went to Sardinia, Italy? No. Okay, so they went to the first Blue Zone. You know, Blue Zone's most Centurions. They went there. And they had two genetic researchers that were there. And even if I don't agree with something for like an exposure just in life, I will listen to it. Sure. To try and be more because I can, you and me will, are not going to agree on everything, but it doesn't mean it's, it means anything about our friendship, yeah. which is something else we could talk about for 50 hours. No, I've, I've done plenty of that, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, oh, oh, you support this person? Nope, can't be friends. So, you know, it's total black and white. Yeah, it's, it's totally. It's ridiculous. But, but they did say something that was interesting. And they were very honest. They're, they're both geneticists, I believe, PhDs in genetics. 
and they were looking at the Italian diet, the Sardinian diet from Sicily. Okay. And they, they said, you know, in America, you guys are anti-carbs and fats at different periods of time. Well, in Italy, they mainly, as we both know, we're Italian, they eat basically carbs and fats and low protein. Yeah. So what they thought was, and they don't know for sure, they think that as you get older, 70, 80, 90, your body doesn't need as much protein synthesis. Okay. So mTOR, the amount from the, whatever mTOR was doing physiologically, that they don't know if that extra protein synthesis is a contributor to like cell proliferation in malignant tumors or cardiovascular disease. So huh. they think because they eat such low protein because they're not, they don't need protein when you're 90. At that degree, they eat the bare minimum. Mm -hmm. They said the average Sardinia person eats like 0.3 grams per body weight a day. You mm -hmm. know, that's very low. Yeah. Um, but their average life expectancy is in their 90s. Mm -hmm. But if they traced all of Sardinia back to back to the beginning, it's from five families. Okay. Five. So is it genetic? Or is it the protein? It's just a cool thing to look at. Yeah. I'm not agreeing with any of it. I just think it's interesting to look at. Sure. You know, um, I'm very skeptical about any sort of highly black and white statements. You know how it goes. Usually when people are. Yeah. Confused, there's, a, there's a lot of gray in life. So it's a lot of gray. It's not <clears throat> that easy. I mean, if you really want to talk about the most influential thing in the human body, it's genetic coding. It's our genes. Some people have the BRA, the breast cancer gene, some women. If you have the BRA gene, you probably have to be careful with lifestyle factors. You also have to get mammograms earlier age, I think starting at 40. Uh, like my, my wife's mom had breast cancer stage one. Mm -hmm. So she's got to start getting mammograms when she's younger. My dad died of pancreatic cancer, so I got to get my pancreas checked a little bit younger. Like our genes are everything. And I, what I tell people, like as we both know, your environment and your lifestyle is what can su suppress or what can express those genes. So that's you know? I was I was going to I was going to give you a little pushback cuz I'm not that I'm a like not that I don't think your genes have anything to do with it, but I'm more of a, a lifestyle choice person. Per well, let me ask you a question. Then. Let me ask you a question. <laughs> okay. I, if I am too. I'm mm -hmm. 100% like that. But let's say gene wise Let's say there's a gene that – I don't know shit about what genes they are. Sure. What happens if you and me both have a gene that is more predisposition to, say, being an addict, which I believe is MOE4 because I've read an addiction research paper. Mm -hmm. So we have that gene, but you and me have poor lifestyle habits. Are we more inclined to be a habit? That's where it's like it's so great. I yeah. don't know. It's hard to look at it like that. Now, listen, you cannot tell me just because you have a gene for something that that's going to express. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you. Your lifestyle factors are probably the most important thing with expressing those genes. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, okay. Like, so, yeah, yeah, So that's that's kind of along the same lines as I yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no. If you have a gene, just because you have a gene, I in no way believe that you are going to get something. Sure. But I do believe this. If you have the BRA gene for a female, I think 40% of females have it. So it's like one, one in three, one in two and a half, yeah. you know? So if, you have, nice. you know, if you have the BRA gene and you smoke a pack of cigarettes a day and you well. don't eat healthy, <laughs> that lifestyle factor is has a chance of, of basically expressing mm -hmm. that gene into a more pathological condition. That's how I see genes. But the, the problem is, is you get the people on the other side. Remember these ones? You, I know you've heard this. You have to eat for your genes. I'm like, uh -huh. I don't even know what that means. That was you like know? the uh, that was like the blood type thing too. Like eat oh, for your blood, blood type. Diet? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I was just I remember hearing that and I was just like, that there's no way that's a thing. <laughs> like, no. Wait, talk about <laughs> someone, about someone who lost their shit was Lane. Lane did a huge video on that, having a meltdown. Uh, yeah. Do you want to know the do you want to know the analogy I said the other day? My buddy was he's like, oh my gosh, we have to put that on a shirt. Um, <laughs> you know who Ben Shapiro is, right? Of course. 
Okay. <laughs> I said that we were on the gym and I'm like, you know what? Lane Norton is the Ben Shapiro of fitness. <laughs> Why me complainy, always starting fights. <laughs> I love him. I love Lane. I love his research. I've been following him longer than anyone. But man, does his delivery suck. <laughs> oh yeah, no, he, he definitely rubs a bunch of people the wrong way. But yeah, and he just will be like, this is Lane. But he doesn't care either, which I think is no, he doesn't care. part of his appeal. He'll, like, <laughs> he'll, he'll make a post and someone will, will ask a genuine question. They'll be like, hey man, like I thought it was like this. He'd be like, you effing moron! <laughs> it's okay. This kid is twelve. <laughs> yeah, yeah, relax, Lane. <laughs> um, no, yeah, I, I just, yeah, I remember. I do remember like the blood type thing and heat for your genes, and like I even had like people, and I, I remember, uh, I remember my not, a friend of my mother just like did the got her genetics done and then like started eating for her genes and blah blah blah, and like it. It worked, and I, she was just like, "Oh my god, like this is amazing!" and blah blah blah. Like I'm eating more like chicken and like vegetables and rice because like that's what it's telling me. Like my gene, I was just like, "That's like what every nutritionist tells you to eat." Like, what, what <laughs> are you talking about? I know it's it's really funny too. Like I said, we've talked about this before, and and I I get kickback from this, and I and I and I see where they're coming from, you know, but. The research is, is in a metabolic ward, as we said, where they can control everything because they're, they have to live in the hospital so they can't even get access to other food. So it's the most controlled type of research they can do in nutrition. And, dude, the changes in your health are really coming from the drop in body weight. I mean, yeah. adipocytes themselves are highly pro-inflammatory. You know, Having large amounts of subcutaneous fat and large amounts of vi – well, visceral fat's really dangerous, as we know. Yep. Non-alcoholic fat, fatty liver disease. I mean, that's what causes people to have atherosclerosis and, and die of widow-maker heart attacks and fatty deposits around their cardiac. You know, it's it's definitely a problem, and, and I think people forget, and it's so multifactorial. Like, I'll give you a great example. We have a patient. She's a nurse. She's so unhealthy. Mm. And she's like, I never feel good, but it's, it's hard to approach it. Like, well, did you ever think you're not feeling good because you're so unhealthy? Like you're so It's, it's definitely a tough conversation to have with people. It's really tough. Cause you don't want to be like, Hey, look, you're fat. You have to lose weight, but you have to be like, you have to plant some seeds. It's all about, you know, as we know, perspectives, like, Hey, did you ever think about, you know, maybe if you lost 10% body fat, maybe your knees would feel better. Maybe your arthritis in your knees wouldn't be as bad because you're not carrying as much weight in that big stomach you have, you know? So it's it's tough. It's it's really tough. And I get it. Like, I really understand, like, it would be like if you and someone came up to you and me and were like, well, what do you mean you don't know about x-ray physics? Like, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know anything about that. They don't well, know. Yeah. No, but I know. The, the thing about nutrition is there's not – false information being plastered in magazines about x-ray physics. <laughs> like there's, false, there's false stuff everywhere about nutrition and exercise. Yeah. <laughs> it's everywhere, you know? No, it's, and it's, it's, uh, it's true, man. And, yeah, uh, it's typical. Like the, the magazine, uh, magazines might be a dying kind of industry for that, but, uh, but like the magazines and the Instagram and all that stuff, like it's, it's, it, it's potentially dangerous. Like giving these people, like you're, you're giving people false information to make choices about their health. That's leading them down a road that, you know, may end up in like an untimely death. Like it's, it's kind of scary to think about. Oh, it absolutely is. I have a great, not to cut you off. I have a great yeah, topic to end it with. All right. Be as, you can be as honest to me as you want, or you can lie. <laughs> um, and before I premise this, I have nothing wrong with people if someone is 900 pounds, that doesn't bother my life at all. That's yeah. your life, your decisions. So what's your opinion, multifactorial, on the movement about obesity and like being obese in magazines and obesity is okay and stuff like that? What's your opinion on that whole thing? Um, I have no problem with, you know, people making the decisions – food-wise, exercise-wise, whatever. It's your body, it's your health, it's completely up to you. 
Um, I also don't have a problem with like, you know, equal parts representation. So like, if you want to have like an overweight model, do your stuff, fine. The thing I had a problem with um, was, and I don't know what magazine, but actually a buddy of mine um, sent me this picture. It was a very large woman who was dancing, so she could still move around, but like dancing, and it said healthy. Like, that's a lie. Like to me, that's that's where it's not okay. Like if you name you you hit exactly how I feel. You know, listen, shaming shame comes from one thing. Okay, do you know who Dr. Brene Brown is? No. Dr. Brene Brown, you'd probably really you and your wife with that soon to be wife. Well, not yet. <laughs> well, really, I think it would <laughs> like her special. So she's a twenty year researcher from Texas on shame, courage, and on vulnerability. She literally no. is a shame researcher. She's probably number one or the most famous. And shame comes from one thing and one thing only, only not having unconditional acceptance for yourself. Now, what do I, let's use an extreme example. I can murder someone and, and have this. I didn't like that. That was not good. But I accept myself for my flaws. And you would have no shame. Mm -hmm. None. Not because they're a sociopath. It's because you unconditionally accept yourself. Now, listen, do I think that someone can unconditionally accept themselves being overweight? Yes. They can be content, happy, no anxiety, loving life. But I agree with you. If you're going to tell me that 50 BMI is healthy, I don't agree. Yeah. And I'm not going to agree with that. We have standards for a reason. Um, it's not healthy. We know that. Obesity, morbidly obesity is not healthy. And I think that's to me, like it falls into the same, like it's, look, if you want to smoke, fine. Like we clearly know, but no one's putting someone chain smoking a box of cigarettes on a magazine and saying healthy, like don't lie. Like it's okay. Like if you, again, if you want like representation, I'm all about like the equal representation movement, you know, watching TV, I see, you know, there's definitely like there's more black people on TV. There's more Hispanic people. There's more, I've seen multiracial couples on TV and I'm all about it. Like should give everyone Absolutely. as much representation as you want. You want to have overweight models. Great. You want to have skinny models. Great. You want to have buff models, What like whatever, but don't lie. Like, and, and I, I realize in advertisement, there's always like that white lie or whatever, but if you plaster an overweight person on a magazine and then you right over top, you say healthy, like that's, that's not okay. No, it, it's the same thing, like, this is another extreme example, and I don't like to use it because we know many people who have passed away, but, like, it would be like if you put me on the front of, of People magazine shooting heroin into my vein, <laughs> and it was, like, healthy. Healthy. It's like, oh, it's healthy. <laughs> Listen, I'm accepting you. I understand. I'm a, I have addict, big addict issues, so I understand that. Like, I don't can't go near certain things because – it's not good for me. And I have to understand that about myself. It's not a good or a bad thing. It's just who I am, you mm -hmm. know, as a person, that's just part of who I am. And I just have to accept that. But it doesn't mean that my addictions are healthy. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. the same exact way. There's, you know? there's the, yeah, exactly. There's, there's, it's one thing again, to give the representation and to make people like, like if, if you're okay with the choices that you made and what you're doing, great. But don't like, Again, don't show someone, you know, snorting a lot of cocaine and be like, health. <laughs> like, to be honest, if that was on the, if I actually saw that, that might be the best thing I've ever seen in my life. It, it's just like my, I'd, buy the, I, my I'd buy the magazine. <laughs> it's a guy in Miami on, it, on, a, on a balcony with a guy in the background, the cartel with two guns and he's snorting a lot and it just health. says, hell. Men's health. <laughs> <laughs> Men's health. Oh. But that was a great conversation, man. I gotta do some patient notes, but dude, that was yeah, yeah. that was a lot of fun. No, um, I always love having you on, man. You're always uh, uh, and I, I know now that as soon as you come on, I start recording because <laughs> you just dive right. In. I dive right in. <laughs> Listen, I, I literally had the coffee. I, I made the coffee right before I sat down, and I just I just go. Just go. So, um, well, if you want, before you head out, though, uh, if you want to like shout out your. You know, your office or your Instagram or whatever Maybe else you got, man, just put it out on the internet. <laughs> okay, yes, yeah, so we're, we're mobile chiropractors, my wife and I. We're con we're, we, we changed it to concierge. We were an LLC, but now we're a corporation because the long-term goal 10, 20, 30 years from now is to have 
a full mobile clinic, medical doctors, nurse practitioners, wellness. We have an Instagram page called Axon Health, one word, A-X-O-N Health. We have a YouTube page called the same thing. We upload something on Instagram every day. I literally have my schedule behind me right there. <laughs> so I know what goes on. Like yesterday was a shout out. Today was, it's so funny real quick that you talked about this because today's YouTube uh, uh, Instagram video was about how many days a week should you lift as a beginner? Oh, and I said, we talked about three. Yeah. So, so we talked about that. And I have different days of the week we do that. We do YouTube videos every Saturday. We do mental health stuff on Sunday for the importance of like being outside. So we're big proponents of, of everything. And I, you know, to end it with this, I get asked as a chiropractor, probably the most common question, like, are you anti-medicine or anti-medical doctor? In no way am I anti-anybody. I just think that some people don't need to go to surgery right away. They don't try any passive stuff. Some people don't need to be on certain types of medications when they potentially could have lifestyle changes. Now, if they're on medication for the time being, they can wean themselves off. Now, I can't speak about medication because I'm a chiropractor, but I still have to be taught toxicology because all my patients over 50 are on medication. You know, I have to know. I can't be sitting there being like this. What's this? What's this? What? They're like, you know. So, but yeah, yeah, that's that. But again, man, thanks for having me on. Always a pleasure. Yeah, man. Always fun. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll do it hey, how about this? No one a good one, real quick. <laughs> Next time we have that, we have this. Yeah. What well, you should? I'll well, bring my wife on. That way you can get a female perspective from it. Dude, I would love so, that. We, and then basically, what's going to happen? I'm just going to kill her on camera, and then you know it'll just be me. All right, great, honey. Bye. <laughs> 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 All right, buddy. I'll talk to you later, man. Take it easy. Have a good one. Later, bud.